Today we're looking at the formation years of the church, the early years. The church is the body of Christ, as Colossians says. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So the church is not under any one person here on earth, although we have leaders. The true head of the body is Christ, and he's the one that directs the church. There are many ways in which the church can go on one direction or the other, but he reproves the church, he brings corrections to the church. And as we saw, this is the role of the prophet, the prophets, is to bring reproof and correction to the people of God so that they can come back. Ephesians also 5.27 says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Keeping that in mind, we know that God's work is not finished with the church. We still have to take out some spots and wrinkles and things that are preventing us from fully representing Jesus to the world. So we can be patient and even look back at the mistakes that happened throughout our history and learn from those mistakes. Let's see the context of where the church was coming from, right? Um, in the early period, right after 1844, where was the church, God's church, God's people coming from? Remember, they had sounded the first angel's message, which was, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And they had also sounded the second angel's message, which said, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, right? So, if the churches, the Protestant churches were fallen, and they came out of them, and the people of God came out of them, they were establishing a new movement, a new church. Although it wasn't organized as a church yet, until 1860, 1860 to 1863. But as this group was coming out of the churches, how were they coming out? Were they free from all the errors that were present in the other churches? Of course not. The papacy's domination had brought darkness to the true church of God. If you see the list of things that the papacy was promoting through the centuries, you will see why it was so dark in the Dark Ages. It was very dark. From the worship of Mary to relics, the worship of relics, the understanding also of purgatory, the idea that we die but the soul lives forever. It was all a mixing, either originated or mixed by the Roman Church with pagan philosophy and pagan beliefs. Sunday worship, you know, confession uh, in the sense of confessing to a priest. This was just like the Babylonian system of worship. So many errors had come into the church through the agency of the papacy. And I'm not talking about the, the Roman church now. Into the true church, which was the church in the wilderness, the Waldensian church, and many other small groups of people who were still preserving the, the Bible and being faithful to God and being persecuted by the Roman church. The, the true church in the wilderness was being persecuted by the Roman church, by the papacy. And they also accepted the errors of the papacy. Remember, we read that at around 1500, the Waldensians were receiving baptism. Many of them were, by fear, receiving baptism from the hands of Catholic priests. And they were attending Mass. 
So they were corrupted by the heirs of the papacy. In order to raise up a people that would be able to stand when Christ came, many truths which had been hidden for ages had to be rediscovered. The way was prepared for another message, the third angel's message. The vision of the three steps. Remember I mentioned to you that there was a man called William Foy, which came before Ellen White, and he was a prophet of God. He was called to be a prophet. So let's see, this is the vision he had. Loughborough, speaking about him, says, Mr. Foy's work continued until the year 1844, near the close of the 2300 days. Then he was favored with another manifestation of the Holy Spirit, a third vision, one which he did not understand. In this, he was shown the pathway of the people of God through to the heavenly city. He saw a great platform or step on which multitudes of people gathered. Occasionally, one would drop through, through this platform out of sight, and of such an one, it was said to him, apostatized. Then he saw the people rise to a second step or platform, and some there also dropped through the platform out of sight. Finally, a third platform appeared, which extended to the gates of the holy city. A great company gathered with those who had advanced to this platform. As he expected the Lord Jesus to come in a very short time, he failed to recognize the fact that a third message was to follow the first and second messages of Revelation 14. Consequently, the vision was to him unexplainable, and he ceased public speaking. After the close of the prophetic period, in the year 1845, he heard another relate the same vision with the explanation that the first and second messages had been given and that a third was to follow. Soon after this, Mr. Foy sickened and died. You can see here the three messages. The first and the second were given by the Millerites, but they didn't give the third angel's message. They weren't ready for it. After the disappointment, we see a period of great trial to the, to the people of God. Ellen White says, the passing of the time in 1844 was followed by a period of great trial to those who, were, who still held the Advent faith. Their only relief, so far as ascertaining their true position was concerned, was the light which directed their minds to the sanctuary above. Some renounced their faith in the, their former reckoning of the prophetic periods and ascribed to human or satanic agencies the powerful influence of the Holy Spirit which had attended the Advent movement. Another class firmly held that the Lord had led them in their past experience, and as they waited and watched and prayed to know the will of God, they saw that their great high priest had entered upon another work of ministration, and following him by faith, they were led to see also the closing work of the church. They had a clear understanding of the first and second angel's messages and were prepared to receive and give to the world the solemn warning of the third angel of Revelation 14. As they looked at the sanctuary, they were able to see that there was another work to be done. The ark of God was revealed and they had a clear understanding of the messages before. Revelation 11:19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thundering, thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. What is seen inside the temple? The ark, right? Now if we go back to our pictures here, what was inside the ark? in the earthly temple, in the earthly tabernacle. There was something inside, which was the Ten Commandments, right? The Table of Ten Commandments. So, do you think that the 
earthly tabernacle was different than the heavenly one? It was different in the size, right? In the glory. But the items were still the same. Because Moses copied the items of the, the, that were present in, in the heavenly tabernacle. So, in Revelation chapter 1, we see a description of several items that were um, of, of a couple items that were inside the heavenly tabernacle or sanctuary. And it is just like the earthly tabernacle. In the book of Revelation, actually, I meant to say, in the book of Revelation, we see several items that were inside the earthly tabernacle that are also inside the heavenly tabernacle or temple. Inside the ark, there were the Ten Commandments. So the announcement that the ark was seen is also helpful for us to see that it was time for the Ten Commandments to become prominent to the world. So we already saw this. Hiram Anson was in the, in the day of October, October 23, 1844, early morning, not quite early, maybe around 9 o'clock, that's what we understand because he said after breakfast, right? So around 9 o'clock, let's say, he had the vision of Christ entering the most holy place or ministering in the most holy place. He understood that. So the ark was seen in heaven and the Ten Commandments were there. So here are several of the truths that came with the third angel's message. The gift of prophecy clearly is part of the third angel's message because that's where Ellen White had her ministry. It was during the third angel's message. The heavenly sanctuary is also part of the third angel's message. And the two quite prominent persons to to describe it and to talk about it and to write about it were Hiram Edson and O.R.L. Crozier. The Ten Commandments were seen because they were prominent, they are prominent in the Third Angel's Message because the Ark was seen in the Heavenly Sanctuary. And the Ark is basically a, a, a box to keep the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments represent the character of God. It is so sacred that He illustrates the sacredness of it to us by putting it in the most holy place in the universe. There is no holier place than the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. And inside that ark are the Ten Commandments. The seventh-day Sabbath was also brought to prominence. And it was through Rachel Preston, Joseph Bates, T.M. Preble. We'll see a little more on this. The true state of the dead was also made prominent through the, in the third angel's message. How are the dead, uh, what's the condition, the state that they are in? All through the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church was preaching, was teaching that the dead don't really die. I mean, they, their physical body die, but their soul remains alive, just like paganism. And they forgot about the truths of the Bible. They were also teaching about purgatory, teaching about eternal hell, you know, and suffering. And George Storrs was the person whom God used to bring this, this truth of the state of the dead, that the dead really die. The soul is not immortal. There is only one who has immortality, which is God. So the soul dies. And he, he, he was used by God to do this. Also, the Laodicean message is part of the third angel's message. And not because it has to be, but because the church didn't accept the, the reproof or the, the teachings of God. They didn't keep together. So God had to, to bring the Laodicean message to show us our backslidings and to point us to the right direction. So let's uh, see this about Rachel Preston. During the midnight cry of, in 1844, the Lord began to lead the minds of His people 
to the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath. This doctrine among Adventists arose on this wise. Rachel Preston, a Seventh-day Baptist, moved to Washington, New Hampshire, where there was a church of Adventists. She accepted the doctrine, the Advent doctrine, and that church, composed of about 40 members, through her missionary labors, accepted the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. In fact, she came to the pastor of that church. I think he was preaching about um, the commandments of God. And, and I don't remember if she interrupted him or she called him you know, to a uh, private interview. But she said, why are you talking about the commandments if you don't keep the commandments? And he was surprised for her to say that he didn't keep the commandments. He thought he did. And then she said, you don't keep the, the true Sabbath. The Bible talks about the seventh day Sabbath, and you're keeping the first day. And he decided to look into it, and he found out that she was correct. She was a seventh day Baptist. So, you know, before the Seventh-day Adventists were keeping the Sabbath, there was a Baptist group. It wasn't big, but it was a Baptist group that was keeping the Sabbath, the true Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day. And this Baptist group um, was one of the witnesses which were still holding uh, tight to what God had shown from the beginning of the world, the true Sabbath of the Lord, right? God had witnesses all through the ages to, to keep the truth. So a Seventh-day Baptist brought to our movement, to our church, the Sabbath of the Lord. And, and the pastor then realized, oh, this is the true Sabbath. And he came to his church and he presented it to the church. And you know, the whole church accepted it. It became the first Seventh-day Adventist church. Not with the name Seventh-day Adventist, but they were Adventists and they began to keep the true Sabbath of the Lord. Another person that brought attention to the Sabbath was T.M. Preble. The attention of the Adventists as a body was called to the Sabbath question by an essay on the subject from T.M. Preble dated February 13, 1845 and published in the Hope of Israel in Portland, Maine, February 28, 1845. After showing the claims of the Bible Sabbath and the fact that it was changed to Sunday by the great apostasy, he remarks, Thus we see Daniel 7.25 fulfilled, the little horn changing times and laws. Therefore, it appears to me that all who keep the first day for the Sabbath are the Pope's Sunday keepers and God's Sabbath breakers. Wow, pretty clear. He went straight to the point. And this was 1845. Isn't that amazing? What a summary. Joseph Bates, his experience was on this wise. Hearing of the company in Washington, New Hampshire. Where was it? Where Rachel Preston was, right? So he heard of that church that was keeping the Sabbath, that were keeping the Sabbath. He concluded to visit that church and see what it meant. He accordingly did so, and on studying the subject with them, he saw they were correct, and at once accepted the light on the Sabbath question. On returning to New Bedford, Massachusetts, he met on the bridge between New Bedford and Fairhaven a prominent brother who accosted him thus, Captain Bates, what is the news? Elder Bates replied, The news is that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. Well, said the man, I will go home and read my Bible and see about that. So he did. And when next they met, this brother had accepted the Sabbath truth and was obeying it. How amazing is that? He comes to Captain Bates, which was a man that was traveling all over the world, and they would ask him, what is the news? Oh, something's happening in Brazil. Oh, something's happening in Europe. Because that's, what they, that's how they knew a lot of things. They were traveling. But he comes next and says, what is the news? He says, oh, the seventh day is the Sabbath. 
That man goes home, studies the Bible and says, that, that's true. I will, I'll keep it. <laughs> and Elder Bates was not just um, a Sabbath believer now. He was active. And he decided to promote it. And that's what we need today. We need people that are not only um, accepting things, but that take it and run with it. Take the, the, the truth and promote it, right? So Elder Bates at once began to preach this truth from state to state. Remember when he accepted the truth regarding the, the coming of Jesus? The Millerites? Um, the 2300 days, I should say, because um, the coming of Jesus was not the truth at that time. The investigative judgment was the truth. But when he accepted that, he was going to the southern states and preaching the message. So when he accepted the Sabbath truth, then he went from state to state and he was preaching it. He soon saw that a book or even a tract, a tract on the Sabbath question would be a great help to him in his work. And his soul was moved by the Spirit of God to write and publish something on this subject. But how it could be done without money was the question as all that he had was a yark shilling, 12 and a half cents, which is, I guess, about $12 or so, you know. It wasn't much. It was very little. I mean, do you remember what he had when uh, his wife came to him, saying that he, she needed uh, four pounds of flour? He didn't have them. I mean, he only bought the four pounds of flour. And then that experience happened when... He felt that there was money for him in the mail. He went there, and there was. And then he bought a barrel of flour. It was during that time. He was writing, and I think he was writing about the Sabbath at that, in that day. He was preparing the tract on the Sabbath. So how could he publish without money? That's a good question. And it's a question that God can answer. And he always answers. As the work of writing and printing progressed, Captain Bates received money from time to time through the mail and otherwise, sometimes from persons he had never met. As he received the money, it was passed over to the printers and applied on the book account. Finally, the day came when the books were all printed and from a source unexpected by Brother Bates, the balance of the account was met. Thus, the books were not delayed even a day in their circulation. Here was a man of faith, right? He said, this is the truth. It must be presented to the world. I will go ahead and do it. And God will provide the means. Because this is needed. He did that, and not even one day the books were delayed in coming out of the printer. Because God sent the means. The last bill paid. H.S. Gurney of Memphis, Michigan, told me that in March... 1844, he, on the very morning Elder Bates' book was completed, received $100 on an outlawed note from a man who declared he would never pay him. Having received this money, he esteemed it a pleasure to spend a portion of it in paying the last bill on the Sabbath tract of Elder Bates. But, said Mr. Gurney, Brother Bates never knew to the day of his death who paid the balance of the book bill. Who paid the balance of the book bill? This experience of Elder Bates in printing the Sabbath truth seemed to say to our people from the very beginning of publishing the truth on the Sabbath question, go forward in this line of work and expect God's providence to open the way as you advance. So the Sabbath truth was printed and circulated. Did you know James and Alan were influenced to uh, accept the Sabbath by Elder Bates, by his writings. So the church received, if you retrace back, it received through Rachel Preston, then through Elder Bates, and then it came to the church at large. It's amazing how God can use anybody, and even sometimes people that we wouldn't expect, you know, somebody from another church, but yet it was the instrument. And she actually accepted the, the Seventh-day, uh, the Advent message, I meant to say. 
she accepted the Advent message and um, was part of the movement, Rachel Preston. Now, talking about the state of the dead, George Storrs is the man who God used to bring this truth to us. Storrs' six sermons. Soon after this coming out, we note that the light came to the Advent bands on the subject of future punishment as set forth in the pamphlet Six Sermons by George Storrs, taking the position that man by nature is mortal, that the dead are unconscious between death and the resurrection, that the final punishment of the ungodly will be total extinction, and that immortality is a gift of God to be received only by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thousands of the Adventists accepted this doctrine of man's nature, but not all of them. The rejection of it brought no confusion among them, as it was regarded as a matter of belief simply, and no test of moral standing. Hence, the united effort to warn the world of the near approach of Christ was unbroken. It did, however, have the effect to stir up the ire of the churches against them. Then came a change. The Advent band, the group, was strong in the faith. They were finding new truths, and they were watching. But as time passed, they began to be less careful. They began to sleep. And God had to raise them, uh, send a message to raise them up. Ellen White says, As I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, my mind has been much exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal like the nominal churches from which they but a short time since separated. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. They are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. And unless they heed the counsel of the faithful and true witness and zealously repent and obtain good uh, gold tried in the fire, white raiment and ice have, he will spew them out of his mouth. When was the Laodicean message sent to the church? When did it begin? 1852. It was right after. If we look in a perspective from our time to 1844, from this year to 1844, it's been a long many years. Basically right after the church was already in the Laodicean condition. Ellen White says, don't move a block or a pin. She says here in the fourth, uh, third line, she says, My accompanying angel uh, said this, right? Said my accompanying angel, Woe to him who shall move a block or steer a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. So God didn't want people changing the messages that were given to us. Today you see people denying those messages, saying that we are we were confused and that you know many of the truths are not really truths. But it is just as this uh, slide here explains. They were looking at the platform and saying, oh, maybe this platform is not strong enough, maybe it's incorrect. And they would fall from the from the platform. Then we have the organization of ministries. The publishing ministry began in 1846 when James White published the first one-page tract. And in 1847, he printed the Word to the Little Flock, which has three visions of Ellen White and a few other things that he writes. So publishing began then. The organization of the church happened through the years 1860 to 1863, in 1863, the General Conference was organized. It was in that same, um, same event of organization, they asked James White to make the new charts. Remember? 
the charts, the, they were using charts to preach the prophecies. And those charts that he made didn't have the 2520. So w the Adventist church as organized never taught 2520. It's not a Seventh-day Adventist belief. It was never. The health ministry uh, or ministry began from 1863 when Ellen White had that vision about health through 1866. And the education ministry began in 1872. In the next period, we will see more about the, the following era, what happened to the movement as time progressed. But at least you can see here that these were the beginning of each of the ministries. And we will see how, what an impact they had and how close it was for Christ to come even back then.